Before we begin with today's scary Let's Not Meet stories, make sure that if this is the first time you're joining us on the Creepy Fox Podcast, that you hit that subscribe button as we upload some of the best scary stories that you'll ever hear on YouTube. Also, if you are a current subscriber, make sure you check below the video player and ensure that you're still subscribed. I've mentioned this on previous episodes, but YouTube seems to be unsubscribing people for no reason whatsoever, so just take a few seconds to check. But with that said, let's begin with these scary stories, because we got a lot of good ones to cover today. Enjoy. A little bit of backstory before we get into things. I grew up in upstate New York, about 30 minutes north of Syracuse to be exact. It only made sense that I would return to my quiet little part of the world after I got out of the Marines in 2007. The only problem is that I didn't have much money. The good news is that my grandfather had an old pull behind camper that he told me I could have until I got back on my feet. So being on my own, I decided I would spend about a year in the pool behind on a few acres of woods that I had bought from a friend of mine while I was in the Marines. Taxes had been paid for the year, so the only thing I had to do was pay for gas and propane. I managed to avoid looking like a crazy mountain man by showering and washing my clothes at a local truck stop slash diner and even got a pretty decent job working security. I filled the rest of my time working odd jobs for extra cash. But alright, now on to the main story. It was mid-April and I was sitting next to a nice low fire while listening to my battery powered radio and watching nightfall in the woods. I had gotten a nice dinner at the diner down the road and I didn't have any work for the next few days. Generally, I didn't see anyone in the woods for weeks at a time so I wasn't expecting it when I suddenly heard a scream break the silence. I shot up and grabbed my shotgun out of the small camper and checked the chamber to make sure that it was loaded. I stood at the edge of the small clearing and strained my ears to listen for any new sounds. Now, it is generally hard to pinpoint the direction of a noise out in the middle of the woods at night. Luckily, I heard some shouting and car door slamming, so I knew that the sounds had to be coming from the main vehicle trail, which was a short distance from my campsite. I then made my way to the trail as fast as I could, and that was in the low light, and before I could get halfway there, I heard another clipped scream to my left. I could then hear a rustling in the brush, and I slowly made my way over to where I thought the noise was coming from. I came out of the woods, right next to a man who had a woman pinned to the ground, and another leering man standing just behind him. Shaking from adrenaline, I leveled the shotgun at the guy on top of the woman and growled at him to get off. Now, I'm a big guy, but I have no doubt that the shotgun was the deciding factor in this whole situation. Each of these guys easily had a solid 30 pounds of muscle on me and I was a 200 pound marine. I ushered the two idiots back, so I was between them and the woman, who was now getting to their feet. It was about now I realized that we had another problem. My cell phone was cheap, and it didn't get reception in the woods. Hers had been broken by these two sickos. Now, there wasn't much I could do, other than march these two back to their shifty lifted jeep which was under threat of a shotgun. I got their license plate number, names I was sure were fake, and a description of them and their vehicle. Before the driver got in the vehicle, I lowered the shotgun to his crotch and I made sure he understood what a 3 inch, 12 gauge shell loaded with buckshot could do to a man's genitals. They took off in one direction and myself and the woman made our way back to my campsite. We now drove to the DEC station as soon as possible and reported the entire incident. It turns out that the guy I hadn't threatened was the young woman's now ex-boyfriend. They had all been out having a few drinks 
when the third wheel in the situation got a little too handsy for her liking. When she said something to her boyfriend, he basically told her to stop being so stuck up and to put out for once. When she refused, the boyfriend took her phone and then smashed it on the ground. They both then pushed her into the truck and drove her deeper into the woods. She had waited for them to become complacent before throwing the back door open and then jumping out of the jeep and taking off. Luckily the jeep was a pile of shit and the back door didn't lock. It was also a stroke of luck that I happened to be outside when she managed to escape. Fast forward about 7 months and that woman I helped out became my wife and we moved into our first house using the money I had been living in the woods to save up. We've now been married for 8 years and we have 2 kids, a 6 year old boy and a 4 year old girl. I still go out to the camp every year so I can go hunt and I haven't seen the jeep or the potential rapists again. We heard it through the grapevine that they had been arrested but somehow got off without any actual jail time. I'm assuming they moved either into the city or further away because we haven't seen them again. So to the two potential rapists in the jeep, I know who you are and for your sake, let's never meet again. Edit. So I've gotten a few questions about how things went between me and my wife after the incident. At first, she was a little bit creeped out by my lifestyle. You know the big scary guy living in a pool behind in the woods? But I explained to her that it was just because I needed a bit of quiet and that I was saving money, and then she understood. She let me drive her out to urgent care to get checked out, and we spent about 4-5 to five hours talking in the waiting room. That was probably the only time I ever enjoyed sitting in a damn waiting room. She was okay. She just had a nasty bump on the head, but that gave us time to talk. Now it might be a little classless, but I asked her for her number after that, and our first date was dinner at her parents' house. After that, things just kind of steamrolled, and I couldn't help but pop the question after only three months. As far as that shotgun goes, it's sitting in the gun safe as I speak. We call it the matchmaker, and... When I get a bit of time off, I'm going to sand the stock so she can use the wood burner to put her names and anniversary date into the stock. So let me start by saying that this is my first post here and I really really hope my last. I've been struggling with this for a few years now and I still have a hard time talking about it. But first, some backstory so you can understand the history I had with him and why it messed me up so badly. Almost 12 years ago, I met a guy, Charlie, online, in a video game. We played together for a while and talked every day. Eventually, we exchanged phone numbers. We started texting, calling, and of course we started developing feelings for each other. I decide that I'm an adultish woman at the ripe age of 19 years old, almost 20 years old, and that I should make the 3,000 mile move to be with this guy. At this point, we had been talking for almost two years at this point, and I felt confident in this choice. He promises me everything a girl could want in a relationship, and I fall for it, hook, line, and sinker. I arrive in a southern Texas town and he picks me up from the airport. We then drive to his house. We planned I would live in his grandmother's house, being as it was vacant, and I could afford the rent. He said since his grandmother had passed away, it was something he has cleared with his aunt and I was all good to move in. He originally told me he would move in with me too, which actually never happened. The first red flag should have been when he hid me in the house. I mean, he never got the permission for me to live there, and it turned out that the house was going to be sold in a few weeks. So I ended up on the couch at his parents' house, whom he lived with, by the way. 
His family is really religious, and he didn't want to let them down by finding somewhere else for us. So, I end up living with them for a few months, paying rent by cooking and cleaning for his family. I get a part-time job working with Charlie at a major clothing retailer. This is very important later on, by the way. I go to his church. I fit in with his group of friends, and everything is great. His family likes me, and I'm enjoying my time in Texas. The second red flag I missed was his hesitation to introduce me as his girlfriend. He would simply introduce me as his friend and tell me we are just friends. In private though, it was the opposite. He would tell me he loved me, how much he cared for me, and that he couldn't wait for us to live together. Everyone knew Charlie and I were together, but he denied it. Hard. About six months of this, I was approached by some girl whose name I don't remember and she basically tells me I've stolen her man that one day some girl is going to weasel her way in like I did and I'll know her pain. Then she leaves. I never see her again. Fast forward about two or three years and I'm finally catching on about his shit. I'm tired of being told in public I'm not his girlfriend but in private how much he loves me. We are on and off again at this point, but we still have feelings for each other and decided to really give it another go. A new girl, Lucy, starts to work with us and they become fast friends, her calling at all hours to complain about a jerk boyfriend. I instantly had a bad feeling about her. I hated her, but I tried so hard to like her and to be friends inviting her over for drinks and taking her to concerts. You name it, I tried it against my better judgment. Anyway, her birthday comes up and he takes her to lunch while I'm working and I see this picture he posted of her on Facebook and the look she is giving him in the picture, I just know he is screwing her. My heart sinks, so I confronted him and he tells me it's unfair to question to ask if he is sleeping with her. So, I end up breaking up with him, but decide to stay friends. Biggest mistake of my life. Lucy starts talking about Charlie and his skills in bed, bad-mouthing him and spreading rumors at work. Just crazy stuff. And then, she blames it on me. Around this time, Charlie is also passed over for promotion at work and makes an offhanded comment about how he is going to shoot up the store because of this. Another red flag that I just totally missed. Charlie is let go and rumors run wild. I stay silent because of an investigation at work about the rumors and the comment Charlie made about shooting up the place and I wanted no part of that mess whatsoever. About a week, maybe two later, Charlie asks me to go to the movies with him and I said I would go with him. Charlie then kidnapped me, taking me into the back country, far, far away from anywhere nearby, the middle of nowhere basically. He parks the car and I feel super scared at this point. He hasn't said a word in over 30 minutes and I don't have cell service. He then pulls out a gun, cocks it, points it at me, and tells me to tell the truth, or he's going to kill me. I start crying and telling him I have no idea what he's on about, and he pulls the trigger. It's empty. Charlie cocks it again, and points it again, telling me I need to tell the truth, and that we're playing Russian roulette, and I would die if I kept lying. He did this three more times. Each time was empty. I'm pretty much in hysterics at this point. I can't breathe and I'm crying so hard. He then tosses the gun in the back seat with a laugh and he says, I'm just playing with you. I wanted to see if you kept your story straight. I had to be sure who was lying to me. I'm so glad it's not you. You're a great friend. He then drives us back to town for the movies, talking the whole time like nothing was wrong. 
I am still terrified, and I know I have to get away from him, so I excuse myself part way into the movie. I then go into the restroom, I call a friend to pick me up, and then I call the cops. When all was said and done, they couldn't do anything to him because he never actually hurt me, and he didn't have the gun when they came to his house, and I had no proof that anything happened. Needless to say, I went into hiding, and I later found out he had planned this out with Lucy, and this was her way to get rid of me, because she was jealous. He went on to date Lucy for a few more years, and I had been in hiding from him for five years now. I eventually cut all contact with mutual friends when one of them was having lunch with me and told Charlie all about it. Thankfully I left before he was able to show up, but he apparently wanted to talk to me. I just hope we never meet again, Charlie. This happened to me a couple of months ago now, but when it first happened, Given how crazy it was, it took me a few weeks to collect myself enough to type it up and post it. It's relevant for me to tell you up front that I'm a military veteran and I have PTSD and anxiety as well as a pretty bad case of depression and I'm currently my third year of it. I've read that CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, can massively improve PTSD symptoms and in turn help to reduce anxiety, so I've been trying various techniques at home. The problem there is, my wife and I live in a small two-bedroom, ground floor flat with an upstairs neighbor with absolutely no concept of other people. A jock douchebag type who's a personal trainer, but he trains at home too, because gains. The kind of guy whose only two topics of conversation are protein powder and steamed rice. I'm sure you can imagine the type. Anyway, with that being a constant issue, meditation and quiet mindfulness are just not possible with the constant noise. My solution to this was to do my normal routine during the daytime, but take advantage of my insomnia later on. At around 2300 hours, slash midnight, I would put on my coat and my shoes, and as we live near the beach, I figured I could walk to the beach now that there's pretty much no people around. I could walk on the sand and be mindful to the sounds of the ocean. Sounds nice, doesn't it? It was the first two times, but you know what they say. The third time's the charm. The walk to the beach from my home isn't that far, maybe a little over half a mile, but once I got there, I would walk to the very end of the beach until you reach the cliffs where there is a World War II artillery gun turret, which was another half mile-ish. Sometimes I would walk the path up the cliff to the gun and stare out into the blackness of the midnight ocean, which was only broken by the occasional flash of light from the lighthouse. I would sit and listen to the waves crashing against the cliffs. Sometimes I would close my eyes and just concentrate on nothing but that sound. I felt safe there, knowing I was alone. Just me and the ocean. Usually, before I turn tail and head home, I would walk down to a small row of benches. They're all marked with plaques in remembrance of someone who had also came and enjoyed the view. Although I imagine they came during the daytime. The benches are close to an old pub that was shut down years ago, and I heard the place used to be used as a dodging site, or a brothel, or something like that back in the day. So when I saw vehicle headlights coming towards the pub, I figured it was some young lads trying to catch potential dodgers at it. I sat on the bench, and I waited for the car to pass me, but as it rounded a bend in the road further up, I was momentarily lit up by the headlamps. The headlights of the vehicle went off immediately, and the car went off the road and at his sight for a moment. At this point I was fully alert and a bit cautious, so I dropped to one knee and ducked behind the bench that I had been sitting on. 
The vehicle drove past me. It was only maybe 40 feet from me, and as the lighthouse illuminated the vehicle, I could now see it was an old beat up Land Rover kind of vehicle with shitty camo paint on the wings. At that moment, someone popped out of the top of the vehicle with a scoped rifle and a big torch. In that instant, in my head, I was back in Iraq and my senses felt razor sharp. I dropped onto my belt buckle and crawled into a patch of long grass adjacent to the benches. Then I got into a position where I could see them, but they couldn't see me. The guy with the rifle then shone his torch at the exact bench I had been sitting on, then at the others, as if searching for me. He started looking all around him through the scope, looking for where I might have gone. My heart was pounding so hard, I felt as if they could hear me. I held my sleeves over my mouth to muffle the sound of my breathing, but more importantly, to try and hide the condensation of my breath. The vehicle started to move to get a better view of the benches, so I then started slowly crawling towards the main road, as not only is there a row of houses, but there's also an old stone bus stop that I could take hard cover behind in case they saw me and then decided to open fire. After about five minutes of hiding in the long grass, it started to then rain and they were still clearly looking for me, but were now about 150 feet away. The guy with a rifle was scanning around with his eye down the scope, so I waited until he was looking away from me so I could then seize my moment and then run for cover. I pushed my hands hard into the wet dirt so I could launch myself onto my feet. Then I sprinted towards the bus stop, all the while throwing some zigzags in there just in case they had seen me. Luckily they hadn't, and I was now far enough away that I could take out my phone and call the police. They were there with a riot van and a squad car in about 10 minutes, and as I was talking to the officers in the van, they spotted the gunner's vehicle and took off after them. The officers in the squad car stayed behind to talk to me though. The rain was coming down in sheets by now. They asked me, if I was absolutely sure it was a rifle, and I told them, yes, it was, 100%, no doubt in my mind at all. The officers both looked at each other, and then one of them asked, and what exactly is your experience with firearms? I told them I was ex-army, and I had seen my fair share of all kinds of firearms. They then asked me what I was doing there after midnight, which is a pretty fair question to be honest. I explained that, quite ironically, I was taking a mindfulness walk to ease my PTSD symptoms. They were satisfied with that explanation, if not somewhat amused, and told me that the armed response unit was en route. I asked if they needed me to stay behind and make a statement, but the officers told me not to bother waiting around because they most likely wouldn't need to take a statement beyond the call that I made, and also it was pissing down with rain so I should just get home and get dry. And needless to say, it was over, but I still felt super wired and my heart was still thumping hard in my chest. I started the walk home and when I was about halfway there, a police helicopter buzzed overhead and settled over the area where I had been sitting on the benches with a searchlight going. It was right then that it hit me like a shotgun to the chest. That happened. That was real. And I was here. What the hell? My head started swimming. My heart was pounding twice as hard now. And my legs felt like jelly. Also, my lungs felt glitchy. I couldn't breathe properly. I then dropped to my knees, crying in the street in the pouring rain the only light coming from a nearby street lamp with a flickering bulb. I was gasping for breath, thoughts flashing in my head, thinking that if I had stayed still, if I hadn't hunched behind the bench, if I had done any number of things differently, or hadn't, then I could have gurgled my last breath alone in the dark and in the cold wet dirt, 
and my wife would be none the wiser until the following day. I have no idea if they were even there for me, and if they were, how could they have known I'd be there? I'd been twice before, I suppose. It's not like there's animals to hunt there beyond foxes. But why hunt foxes from a vehicle with a rifle and a torch at midnight? Anyway, I'm not ashamed to say that that experience terrified me. I guess my army training helped me stay alert and to stay hidden, but I don't really know. I don't go walking alone at night anymore, and I have the occasional nightmare about the whole thing. So, that guy with the rifle. Let's not meet. Update. So, Today I made a phone call to the local police department so I could try and get an update on what happened. After a quick description of what the initial incident was, the officer on the phone, I assume she was an officer, was able to find the incident report right away. Basically the first officers on the scene confirmed that they had seen the vehicle and that they had gone off road in pursuit. They said that they had given chase over difficult terrain for as long as they were able to. Then the vehicle turned off all lights and made an escape using the dark as cover. The armed response units were called as a precaution and patrolled the entire area while the helicopter was dispatched in order to try and locate the vehicle with heat cameras. Both teams were unsuccessful in finding them as by the time they had arrived on scene, they had gotten away. CCTV was also checked, but yielded absolutely nothing. I told her I was sorry if they felt I'd wasted their time, and that I guess I had overreacted on account of my PTSD. She told me that as far as they are concerned, I actually did the right thing. She also said that there have been a few isolated accounts of gunshots, which had been heard in that area over the last few years, so maybe rethink taking walks so late at night. I didn't have the energy to explain again why I used to wait until it was late so I could go walking, but any advice about avoiding getting shot is good advice, so instead I just agreed with her and I ended the phone call. After I hung up, I just sat there for a few minutes Going over the whole thing in my head, it was most likely nothing when all is said and done. But if nothing else, it's taught me that being hypervigilant isn't always such a bad thing. On Mother's Day, a few years back, my family decided to take my mom out for a movie and a big dinner to celebrate as well. It was a normal Sunday. We finished our chores around the farm and then got ready to go out. The sun had begun to set as we drove down our road. As we approached the stop sign at the end, two kids we didn't recognize were walking on the shoulder of the highway. They waved, as it is a custom courtesy. My mom didn't wave and told us not to either since we had no idea who they were. I waved anyway because I thought she was just being overvigilant and rude as she could be sometimes. Fast forward to several hours later. We were driving back home under the cover of darkness and we turned down our dark gravel road and we find it swarmed with cops and sheriffs. There were officers in tactical vests who were carrying AR-15s and they're walking through the fields on either side of the road. There were officers walking the wood line and a few cruisers in our driveway as well. We were stopped about 30 yards from the mouth of our driveway by an officer who then asked us if we had seen anyone suspicious walking or driving down our road today. My mom told them that it just so happened that we had. He held up a drawing of a kid's face and asked, if he looked familiar. It was one of the kids we had seen earlier walking the highway. Well, we sat in the middle of our road for another hour before they said that we could go home. As we pulled into the driveway, we could hear our dog howling 
and barking from outside. She was usually of an extremely mild temper. She loved strangers and was a big baby. We unlocked the door and she refused to leave the deck, even growling at the sheriff that had followed us to the door. Of course, they didn't disclose to us what was actually going on until my dad, who was now thoroughly on the edge, demanded to know what was happening. The officer asked if he could step inside to explain. My dad motioned for him to come in and close the door behind him. The back of the door, which was now in plain view, had deep gouges and scrapes in it from our dog clawing and digging at the door. When the sheriff saw this, he sighed and asked if there were any weapons in the house. My dad explained that yes, there were but that they were hidden upstairs. Feeling a little relieved, he then began to explain that there had been a murder earlier that day in a town an hour away, and they had been looking for their main suspect. They had spoken with his friends, and they had gotten information that he had head in our direction and had possibly been hiding somewhere in one of the buildings on our property. The officer told us that it was a good thing that we had a Doberman, otherwise he would have probably broken into the house in search of weapons, car keys, money, etc. He apologized for entering the buildings without my parents' permission, but hoped they understood the reason and severity of the situation. We asked if they found the guy, but they think he might have hidden in one of the barns and waited until it was dark to take off into the woods. We all didn't sleep that night, just in case he came back or was still around. Eventually, they apprehended the kid and he was sentenced to life without parole for the death of his grandparents. Mother's Day Murderer. Let's not meet again. When I was around four or five years old, I lived in an area where everyone pretty much knew each other, if not personally, then at least by sight. There were loads of kids who all played together. This of course was when kids all played outside, but we had big games rounders, slash hide and seek, etc. There was a man who used to give local kids organ lessons in a caravan that was always kept parked in the car park that was three houses down from mine and his own as well. One day I chapped the caravan door knowing a friend of mine was inside. The man who we will call Mr. M wouldn't let me in however. He never seemed to want to let me in, making excuses such as there's too many in already, I'm too busy just now, etc. This particular day I was very upset and felt very left out and I went home crying to my mother, who said to forget about it, and gave me sweets or something to distract me. Fast forward maybe a month or two to one night I was in bed, maybe around 9pm, and I hear people screaming and shouting outside my bedroom window. My bedroom window was at the back of the house, which faced onto Mr. Ram's front door. What I can only describe as a small mob consisting of my adult neighbors were out my back door surrounding Mr. M's front door and being a small kid I had no concept of what was actually going on but in retrospect it was pretty much the torches and pitchfork scenario. I see my dad running towards the car park and that's the last proper memory of that night. Next day I came downstairs and I find two people which I come to learn are CID, serious crime police officers, and they're in my living room. They ask if it's okay if they can ask me some questions, and they tell me that I'm not in trouble, but I begin to cry. Police to me always meant bad things, due to my father's considerable amount of arrests, which I had previously witnessed. They asked about Mr. M, and if I'd ever been in his caravan, which... As I said above, I hadn't, if he had ever touched me inappropriately, said anything inappropriately, etc, etc. Nothing 
had ever happened to me. Unfortunately, the neighbor kids weren't so lucky. Mr. M had been abusing the kids in his caravan under the guise of giving organ lessons and generally being the neighborhood nice old man who always had time and a kind word for the children. Mr. M had previously been in prison for the same charges and his wife had stood by him the whole time. Upon release, the authorities had moved him and his family, wife, one adult son, two teenage daughters, and a grandson, into my neighborhood, an area which was a two minute walk from a primary school, ages 4 to 10, slash 11, and it was populated almost entirely with families and young children. There was a rumor, unconfirmed, his daughter's young child was fathered by him. His entire family knew what was happening, and they did nothing. His daughters I can understand, as they were abused, and were teenagers themselves, but his adult son, and wife. I still can't wrap my head around their silence, especially knowing he had done it before. Their silence is tantamount to condoning it, in my opinion. When I seen my dad running that night, he had spotted the adult son, after sneaking out the back door of their house, trying to escape in his car. My dad smashed his car window, and then assaulted him, and was subsequently arrested, and spent six months in prison. The family were escorted under police protection to what I assume was a safe house that night. Mr. M had been arrested previous to all of this earlier that night. He abused over ten kids. It's been a long time since I've spoken to my mom about this, so I'm unsure of the exact number of children. And the entire thing happened 25-ish years ago, and he was sentenced to seven years in prison. I have no knowledge of what happened to him or his family afterwards, but I know that he would have served only four and a half years max, as LTP prisoners in my country serve three quarters of their sentence. Now, as for my father, he had a reputation as a very scary and intimidating man who was a known criminal with violent tendencies. My mom maintains that it is the reason I was spared the same fate as my friends. I do not condone my father's violence or the way he chose to live his life, but I do believe it saved me in this instance, as anyone who knew my dad and his reputation would know if he found out I did suffer any abuse at the hands of this man, he would hunt down Mr. M as well as every member of his family that knew what he was doing, and murder them without a second thought, and be sure that everyone knew that he did it. I am thankful every day that four to five year old me never entered that caravan, and eternally sorry for my friends who endured what he did. Mr. M and family, I sincerely hope we never meet again, and I hope Karma really does exist. I was working at my first ever job in retail. I was around 20 years old, and it was a busy morning, 9am, somewhere mid-December, hence why it was so busy. I was working the checkouts, as per usual, scanning items, ringing up customers, and all that jazz. About an hour into my shift, I was serving an elderly man who bought just a handful of items after giving him his subtotal and then another guy behind him smelt of booze. He then stretched out, handing me cash. I kindly told them I wasn't serving him and I was serving the man in front of him. Then I looked down and I saw he was buying some cheap knockoff branded Baileys, some booze, and of course, I figured the guy is wasted. Just as I was taking payment from the elderly man, I was planning in my head how I was going to tell the next guy that I could not sell alcohol to him as he's already drunk. As this was my first job, I'd never encountered this sort of thing before. So I finished serving and I was now on to the drunk guy. I looked around in hopes to find another colleague or my manager, but not one in sight or available to help. 
So I looked at the man, and just before I opened my mouth, I felt someone grabbing a fistful of my hair and something sharp poking at me in the back. And of course, a man whispered in my ear, to which I also smelled alcohol on his breath. Serve my mate. He then pushes a knife harder into my back now. In complete shock, I said nothing. I just scanned the bottle, took the cash, and they were gone. I quickly turned around to my colleague working checkouts behind me, but all they did was look at me and asked if I was okay, completely unaware of what had just happened. Then I went for my break. I see my manager pass by, so I rushed over to him and I told him what had just happened. All he did was laugh because he thought that I was joking, but criticized me for selling alcohol to someone under the influence. Now, whatever that sharp object truly was, it actually cut my back, because in my break, I felt blood running down my back, and I was sore. Of course, I couldn't see blood as my uniform is black, but I screamed. It's true. It did happen. I turned around and lifted my hair, as I have very long hair. Lift up my shirt, or get my female colleague to do it. This guy sliced me. The manager just said, however, Ugh, no, I don't want to see you lift up your shirt. He then just walked away, staring into his phone. Well, let's just say that I did not return to my shift. I snuck out the store, took a taxi, and went home. My mother cleaned up my back and dressed it, and the following morning she called work so she could tell them I would not be returning. This was primarily because of the manager's incompetence to take action when I could have almost been stabbed over a damn bottle. I used to sit on the computer at my parents' house and I would chat on AIM with my friends. The main landline for the house sat next to me in that room, by the way. Well, one night, I get a call from a weird number, and the voice on the other end asked for me by name. I told him, yes, that's me, and he proceeded to tell me he was at a bar in a town that I was not from, and saw a for-a-good-time call, and he just gave it a shot to see what kind of person picked up. I told the guy, I'm 16 years old, I can't even get into bars, nor do I know anyone from that area. He started with a, you sound cute, I bet you're a nice girl, huh? He told me he was 18 and he wasn't even supposed to be there, but he had some friends who covered for him. I gave the conversation a chance, however, because I thought one of my friends was messing with me. I was hoping to eventually find out who wrote my name on a wall in the bathroom. He then asked me questions. I asked him questions, and before I knew it, we were talking for hours. He was actually very charming and super interesting. I can't remember what all was said because that was about 14 years ago, but I remember telling him that I worked at a movie theater, and no, I didn't have a boyfriend, and yes, I'd love to meet him sometime. He called me a few times after that night and just chatted with me. The conversation was always flirtatious and even sexual. Fast forward to a week later and I'm at work when I see a guy pull up out front of the movie theater and come inside. He's definitely older than 18 years old and he looks right at me when he comes through the door. My blood ran cold and I immediately got this sick, sinking feeling that it was the guy I'd been talking to. I was stuck at the ticket counter, and he walks over to me and then calls me by name. All I could say is hold on a second, and ran to the other side of the theater where I told a group of co-workers that a guy was here to see me and that he was probably a creep. What can I do? He must have overheard because he bolted out the back door, and then he took off. For the rest of the day, I felt weird, and I was worried and wasn't sure what to do. I told my mother bits and pieces of what was going on, because I knew the situation was sketchy and I didn't help anything at all. The part that I left out 
was the fact that I had been talking to him for a few nights that week and exactly what we were talking about. He calls the house that night and my mother answers the phone. He then asks for me and she asks him, Who is this? He says, None of your business. You just need to let me talk to her. My mom flips out and says, My daughter is 16 years old. Do you know that? I am her mother. It's absolutely my business. How old are you? He said, I am 18 years old, and whatever is going on between me and your daughter is between us. She hounds him for another 20 minutes and tells him she is calling the police. We do some research on his phone number, and we find out he's actually 28 years old. He's married with three kids, and he had been in the army. But we also found several mugshots with arrest from the town that we lived in, and my mother got sick of the whole thing and took me down to the police station to file a report. I sit down and tell the officer that the guy found me at work and he was not who he said he was and that I was scared. The police officer asked if I had any contact with him other than the initial phone call. I admitted that I had been speaking with him for the last few nights, and I told him where I worked. The officer and my mother both began yelling at me for being stupid, and for also having poor judgment. The officer said, if anything else happens, to report the incident, but otherwise, they weren't going to pursue anything. He called back one more time after that, and I was the one who picked up. I told him not to call me again and that the conversation was now over. He told me before I hung up, I just wanted to meet a nice girl, but you started all this drama. I still to this day have no idea how he got my name, or my phone number, or why he wanted a 16 year old, other than the fact he was a creepy bastard, and he was preying on young girls. Yeah, let's not ever meet again. I've posted this before as a reply to a comment. It has been playing on my mind because last week it came up on my time hop and then I thought I'd post it here. So last summer, I booked a glamping trip in the next county over. The website looked beautiful, a campsite of six large yurts outside a lovely little village. Coincidentally, I had driven through that village before as it's close to a really nice historic castle that I like to visit occasionally. So we pay our money, and my husband, two kids and I, pitch up. It's one of the last weekends of the summer, and it was lovely weather. The campsite was on a small hill, and the people who owned it lived on the top of the hill in their farmhouse. We were checking in on a Sunday for two nights as we were shift workers at the time. We passed other people checking out, and they all looked really happy. The owners of the site showed us down to our yurt, and mentioned that we were the only ones on the site for our stay this time, it being a Sunday. We were happy with that to be honest, because with two young kids, it meant that they could make noise if they wanted to, and we would disturb nobody. When she showed us around, she did say the year door didn't lock, but none of them did. Which, okay, fine, because you don't lock a tent, right? The place was its own mini wooded area, and it was absolutely beautiful. The owner also mentioned the kids would be safe to wander because they had perimeter fences because of their dogs. The first night was fun. We had a barbecue. The kids played and then went down to sleep about eight. I found it hard to sleep myself, but I often do somewhere new. There was only patchy phone coverage, so we read until we fell asleep. The next morning, my husband seems a bit odd of sorts, but I asked him if he was alright, and he was like, yeah, fine, so I left it at that. We went out for the day, and we had a blast. The whole day was blazing hot, and then we got back. I was washing up after dinner and the kids were playing around, and a shadow came over the whole place. Honestly, 
I felt eyes on me, and it went really cold. It felt like something bad was going to happen, because I felt dread hit me. Bear in mind, we'd already paid to stay, but I pulled my husband to one side and said, We have to leave right now. I don't know why, but I've just got this bad feeling. Please, let's just go home. Normally he'd try and talk me out of something like this, but he didn't. He started getting the kids together, and I packed our stuff. We went to the farmhouse where the couple who owned it were sat outside playing with their dogs. My husband started loading up the car while I apologized to them and explained we needed to leave because our youngest was feeling ill. They said how sorry they were about it and then just as I turned to leave, the man owner asked if my husband had been outside the house last night about 3 or 4 in the morning. I said no. He hadn't left my side all night. I would have woken up. He asked me if I was sure. By this point, my husband was now by my side. And he answered that no, he hadn't. And why? Well, says the man. The security lights came on. And the dog started barking. And when we looked outside, there was a man wandering around who then turned around and walked back down in the direction of the yurts. They assumed that it was my husband, but we both said it wasn't, and said our goodbyes quickly. I tore out that place in the car, and then about a quarter mile down the road, my husband turned to me and said, You're right. I was quiet this morning. I didn't say anything because I thought you'd take the piss. I wanted to use the bathroom in the wee hours. However, as I was about to get up, I heard footsteps on the decking outside, not hooves or something on four legs, something on two legs. I lay there as quiet as possible and hoped the kids wouldn't wake up or something. Yeah, nope, nope, nope. It still freaks me out to this day. So let me preface this by saying that I grew up in an upper middle class area, a really nice neighborhood with nothing but old people as neighbors. We lived near great schools and there was relatively low crime other than one neighborhood known for meth. When I was maybe 13 years old, we had our first break in. Nobody was home and I had just gotten off the school bus. My mom was waiting at the top of the driveway in her grocery filled car on the phone with my dad. She told me to wait with her since the window was busted out. My dad came home with three friends and got baseball bats to search the house, but there was nothing. The only reason we didn't call the cops is because we have a cat who liked to sit on the window seal and we often left that window open for a breeze, leaving just a screen. So we assumed maybe the cat had knocked the screen out by accident because someone forgot to close it. But then we see a book print in the dirt going to the window and we notice our rug is all scooby dooed with it rolled up from someone running. But we assume they saw our alarm system which tracks movement and flashes. It wasn't even on by the way and they got scared and ran thinking it was a silent alarm. What's odd is one step after entering that window was a computer, a TV, cash, and a camera. Nothing stolen. Second time getting broken into, I was 14 years old, and it was the same exact thing. Window busted. Nothing taken. Footprint. This time we knew it was someone coming after our house, so we started setting the alarm more often. About six months later, I'm in the backyard sitting on a swing with my back facing the woods. My mom comes out on the upper floor deck and calls out to me saying her and my dad are going to see a movie and they're going to be back home in a few hours. I say okay and I come in through the basement door. Stupidly though, I forget to lock it and I stay in the basement in a side room with only one exit point mind you and I play Xbox. 
I put on my nice headset that covers my ears, and I enjoy about 20 minutes of Call of Duty before my cat who is sitting on my lap absolutely freaks out and bolts. I obviously heard nothing because of my headset, but I get up because she was quite scared. I then see the basement door rebounding after presumably slamming open into the wall. My heart then drops, and I think, maybe I left it cracked, and the wind pushed it open. I don't see anyone standing in the doorway by the way, but I remember that right behind the door, there is a huge bush. I then get a bad feeling in my gut, and I bolt upstairs. I now bust through the basement door to the main floor, leaving it open, and I run outside to my neighbors. My neighbors, however, aren't home, but I hide in their yard while looking at my front door, which is opaque glass and somewhat see-through. I wait for about 45 seconds, and I start laughing to myself, and I think I'm just crazy. But that's when I see a six-foot man walk up the basement steps and pass the front door. He then peeks through the glass, and I see he is wearing a brown shirt, and he has short black slash brown hair. Now, I can't tell much else because the glass is opaque and because I was in my neighbor's yard. So I call my parents, but unfortunately, I get no answer. I then call my sister, who luckily worked at that theater and was there, and she answers. I explain there's someone in there, and she gets the on-duty cop to send a bunch over. My sister then rushes in the theater where my parents are in, and they call another neighbor nearby with guns to go check on me. They think I'm still in the house. I see the man in my house turn away from the door and then head left down the hall. There are only two halls, so I saw where he walked to. The left side of the hall has my parents' room and an office room as well. The office room is what he usually entered from, assuming it was the same guy breaking in. After 30 seconds, I see him pass the front door again and go down the right side. That's where my room and my sister's room was. My neighbor is now coming into my yard with a pistol and is calling for me, but doesn't know I'm across the street and I'm too scared to yell to him. Right as he is turning to the front yard, he entered through the side. I see the man come back and go downstairs, where he presumably left through the basement door. My poor neighbor probably thought I was kidnapped so I called him on his cell phone to let him know I was across the street. No joke, six police come, three dogs, and they're all armed and ready. They kneeled in front of my garage, and my parents who rushed home used a garage door opener to let it open. It looked like a movie where they all had guns and dogs out aiming at the garage in case he was hiding. He's not there which I knew this from seeing him go back downstairs, and the dogs start sniffing. They find a scent outside, and they follow it, but they end up just picking up another cop scent and lose it. They search the entire house, and they say it's clear, and I go back inside. We sent a neighborhood email out that night, and the next morning, we got a response from a neighbor six houses down on the edge of the woods. I saw a tall man sprinting through my woods and back into the meth neighborhood. He didn't get a good look at him, but definitely saw him sprinting. So he must have escaped through the back door, ran back into the woods, and gone through there until the end of the woods. The more I thought back on the experience, the more I realized the following things. Number one, it was probably the same guy since Nothing was ever stolen, and they were within a year and a half. Number two, this man clearly didn't want money, because he had a ton of expensive things lying around, and didn't take it. He searched each hall for 30 seconds, and left. He was looking for someone. Number three, when I had my back to the woods on the swing, I think he was watching me. When my parents said they were leaving, he must have taken that as an opportunity. 
He had to have heard me because he came in through the least visible door, the one I had gone through. Number 4. I was in a room that had no exits. If my cat wasn't on me, I wouldn't have heard him and he would have blocked my only exit and done God knows what. Number 5. I was lucky he hid for a second before coming in. I'm guessing he wanted to make sure that nobody else was with me and wanted to listen. Number 6. He was seen running back to the meth neighborhood, so he was probably drugged out and wanted to kill. He never once took an item and only broke in the three times when my parents weren't home. So I strongly believe this man wanted to find me and I think he was watching me in the woods. There's no telling how many days he watched me, however, because I used to sit on that swing nearly every single day. He was probably waiting for the right time for me to be alone. I love my cat to death, and I fully give her credit for saving my life. If she wasn't so loving, and if she didn't want to be on my lap every waking hour of the day, well, I wouldn't have ever known he came in, and don't like even thinking about what he would have done to me when he had my one exit sealed off. It's still super scary to think about it, and I'm not going to lie. I hated being alone even up until I moved out for college. I'd occasionally hear very distinct boot noises running up my stairs and back down. I checked the back deck and I would see if anyone was leaving or not, but I would never see anything. I consistently set the alarm from there on out, and I hated going out on that swing when nobody was home after that. It gave me some lasting paranoia, for sure. So, to the man who most likely wanted to gut me, let's please not meet again. So, here's a story from when I was 19 years old. The funny thing is it doesn't really stick in my memory as a scary moment until I stay in a caravan. Then when the lights start going off, it usually comes flooding back. So for a bit of context, my older brother, as dearly as I love him and owe him, see my first story, is a bit of a dipstick. He's one of those people who goes through life on instinct but the snag is his instincts are generally terrible and it gets him into a lot of scrapes. Every so often one of those scrapes ends up involving me. The one thing he kicks our at is driving. Our dad's a mechanic, so since my brother was a preteen, he's been fixing up and racing a certain model of a car. Well, the racing didn't start until he was a teenager, but still. He's never made much money from it. But as long as he's kept in with weed and booze, he's a happy bunny. Historically, I've never gotten on with his girlfriends. This is in part down to the difficulties I've had befriending other girls throughout the earlier part of my life, but mostly because my brother has a knack for picking up complete head the balls. So when we were chatting bust one night, and he told me he thought his new girlfriend Chantel was the one, I decided to drag myself back up north to meet the poor unfortunate. I can be pretty judgmental, and when I met Chantel, I formed a snap judgment that she was no different to his usual bear of crazy. She had the look that he goes for. Permatanned, platinum blonde girl with huge jugs, which were crammed into a tracky top. Her nails, you can tell a lot about a girl from her nails, were cherry red witchy things. They were bolted on with glue and far too long to allow you to do anything practical. As I entered our living room and I saw her, she was packing away at the screen of her smartphone like a bird trying to text. She barely acknowledged me as my brother introduced us and I think the look I gave him said it all, because before long he was nervously chattering away about anything and everything he imagined we had in common. 
I made all the effort I could after a four hour drive, but she and I could barely hold a two sentence conversation together. When my dad called me into the other room, Storage Hunters was on by the way, and offered me a beer, I all but sprinted out the door. What do you think of Chantel? He asked, casting me the sidelong glance he uses when he expects me to go off on one. I belched at him and left it at that, not really knowing where to begin. You know your brother is pretty taken with her, he says. At this point I pull what my family call Sam's Iguana Look, where I continue to face the television, but look at my dad to my side. What do you want, dad? Well, you could go with him to his race this weekend. I pretty much spat my drink out at that, since his next race was in Scotland, and I just finished my last long-ass drive. Come on, it means so much to him. Nan didn't even take to her, and you know what he thinks about your ma's opinion. Admittedly, this should have been a red flag. My Nan is like a bullshit-seeking missile, and she's old enough that she doesn't give a damn. Just picture Olena Tyrell from Game of Thrones, but she was Irish, and constantly carrying a pack of 20 regal in her bra. However, I'm sentimental sometimes, and my big brother is such a massive piece of work that my opinion probably is quite important to him. My dad senses my hesitation and presses home the advantage until I'm cramming my luggage back into my vehicle along with my brother's gear and Chantel's Barbie pink suitcase, which I'm pretty sure is big enough to serve as a viable alternative to the Soyuz capsule. While I probably shouldn't get further off topic, I like to point out that it later emerged the reason my dad wanted me to go so badly. It was because he had a lady friend coming around and wanted to get his end way. Screw you, dad. Anyway, we take the trip up. My bro leads the way while I follow in my battered old golf making painfully awkward small talk with Chantel in the passenger seat as she pecks away at her phone. The first two hours are an adulterated hell, but eventually we start to talk a little bit more. When I mention that I'd recently been dumped by my boyfriend, she actually switches off the screen and consoles me. She makes me feel better by putting some music on and we bond over a shared love of McFly slash busted oeuvre. By the time we get to my brother's friend's place in Scotland, we're getting on really well. The place we're staying in is on one of those fixed caravan sites. I believe they're called trailer parks in the US. It's a little dingy, especially since holiday season is mostly over and people are leaving ahead of the site closing for the winter but at the same time, the setting is beautiful. Anyway, we get set up inside. Brother and Chantel will get the bed. I will get to hear them knobbing from the converted sofa, and since light is fading and Chantel is complaining about not having three grams, my brother decides to take her poker night at the local pub. I stuck around at the caravan, because I knew I was going to get separated from the others, and probably cornered for some awkward conversation with a pervy old man if I went. They haven't been gone for much more than an hour, mind you. When Chantel starts texting me, the penny drops at this point that this is her thing. I don't know if it's FOMO, or just generally being bored with her surroundings, but I figure that at any one time, she's probably texting four or five people. I don't mind. There's nothing on TV, and with just my music playing in the darkness, give me a break, I was being emo. My thoughts kept drifting back to my boyfriend, so I'm feeling sorry for myself. Her texting style irritates me a little bit, however. She keeps using text speak, but sending really long messages. And because the signal's patchy, 
they keep coming through, either incomplete or in the wrong order, leaving me to piece together what she's talking about, like I'm in memento or something. She also does this weird cross-eyed thing. It's the tongue out emoticon at least twice per message, like XP. After a while, she talks about how the game's getting good and stops sending text messages. Right as I'm drifting off to sleep, I get a call from an unknown number. I decline it out of hand. I've had the same number since I was 15 years old, and I've made some very poor choices with which companies I gave it out to. Then, almost immediately, the same number dials again. At this point, I get pissed off. The boyfriend who ditched me has developed a habit of getting drunk and then calling me looking for an easy shag. I decline the call again and I ignore the voicemail. A short while later, I'm jerked out of sleep by Chantel. She's texting again, asking if I'm still awake and if my brother left the keys to his car in the caravan because he can't find them. I say yes and ask how the poker tournament went. She says, very well, which caravan is it again? At this point I'm rolling my eyes. The one with the names the model of my brother's car outside. Over the music from my earphones, I then hear a noise. It sounded like a man's laugh, but not my brother's. I'm not really sure that's what I heard, but it's isolated as hell out in the campsite and my heart's starting to race. So I stand up and I go to the door. I can see nothing through the people, like it's literally black. There's just no light pollution out here, but as I pull the earphones out, I can hear someone crunching around in the gravel. I damned near shat myself when my phone vibrated in my hand. Another text message from Chantel. Let me in. For some reason, this was the point where my stranded alone in the dark scaredy catness turned into full blown fear. I think it was because the footsteps I could hear were way too heavy and were trying to be way too quiet. Now, my brother's quite light footed, but he's a loud drunk at the same time. I just know I'd have heard him and Chantel coming from a mile off. It's Either that, or my brother would have impersonated a werewolf or something that would have utterly failed to put the shits up me. He's also like a homing pigeon, and there's no way he'd have needed telling which caravan it was. I looked down at Chantel's last few text messages, and I saw the difference in her style. Shorter, capitalized, no annoying derp smiley. I stood frozen in the darkness. I have no idea how long for, but I figured they were after the car, hence asking about the keys. My mind then ran through a detailed CSI style postmortem of them finding my body, which would be riddled in stab wounds and bukkake to death. I was wondering if it was just theft I had to worry about, when my strength of thought was interrupted by a series of bangs and a snapping noise like a whip suddenly cracking. Then I can see a light through the people. I'm in full flight or fight mode now, so it takes me a while to lean forward and look through it again. The security light of the caravan opposite is now on, but the door beneath it is warped and bent from being forced open. I can see one of them rooting around inside while the other stands by my brother's car. Then came the words, the girls not here. As usual with me, flight won over fight. So pretty much as soon as I heard that, I went into the bathroom on the far side of the caravan and pushed the window open. I was sure they'd heard the noise I made getting out. First my shoes squeaking against the fiberglass. I think that's what caravans are made of, right? Then the crunch as I landed in the gravel. 
but I didn't stick around to figure that out. So I bolted into the raised woodland just behind the caravan. Not far, but far enough that I had to feel blindly ahead of myself, just in case I walked into a tree. Once I was completely disorientated, I waited. I waited there for a long time, until I heard first the crash of another door being broken, and no more than a minute later, the sound of screeching tires. I never came out until I heard my brother calling out to me. Even then, I waited until I could see they were alone. I damned near throttled him when Chantel told me he had been bragging all night about how he was going to use his poker winnings so he could buy new brakes for the car he raced. Being the dotting older brother, he was absolutely livid that I'd stood by while his car had been pinched and not taken his keys with me for a jolly little game of cat and mouse with of course some criminals in the woods. I have no idea how I got mentioned at this poker night, but I'm very glad my brother's now wife texts like a child on morphine and that my scumbag ex dumped me so I could mope in the darkness. I wish I could say this is the first and last time that my brother nearly got me killed, but it's not. More to follow one day, if I can be arsed. Anyway, thanks for reading.